All right. So one thing I want to clarify before we, you know, get Randy and, and Hallie going here, um, you know, the pricing that I had mentioned that he did for one of my members, he did that as a huge favor for me in that situation. You know, the price that he would charge you to build all of this out, you know, you guys want to talk to him individually. You want to also want to talk to all other vendor possibilities, right? Um, we're not necessarily recommending any specific person. Um, you guys want to do your due diligence and, and work for something that's comfortable for you. Um, you know, sometimes Randy or Holly aren't the right people. That's okay. I just want them to show you how this was done so that, again, when you talk to other vendors, you are you have some education about it and know what you're looking for and know whether they're giving you bullshit or not. Okay? So with that said, I am going to introduce um, Randy Briggs. Where is he? Hey, can you guys hear me? Yes, sir. How are you? Oh, best I've ever been. And I don't see Holly on here yet. Are you on here? She's on yes, I, I think okay. that you have to view it as the grid so that you can see everyone in it. I don't know if you... Okay, I got you. As long as we can hear you. There you are. Okay. So, um, Randy, you guys are able to share your screen. So, I kind of walked them through, um, you know, some of the behind the scenes and what to look for. I, I also walked them through my marketing plan and what we were trying to accomplish so I'm going to open the floor to you and let you take it from here. Cool. Awesome. Um, so let me share my screen real quick. And if you guys can see that, will you type like yes or roger that or something in the chat just so I know everyone can see it? You can see it. Uh, yes. All right. <laughs> all right. All right. Everyone can see it. All right. Cool. So I know uh, I was on the last session and I saw that, that uh, James went over a little bit, uh, or actually most of this. Um, I'm going to dive a, a little bit deeper. James, how much time do we have to go into this, just so I don't go over or under? Oh, we have an hour and um, hour and a half. Oh, so we can really, really peel back. The, the, yep. Okay, awesome. Okay. Um, so I'll go over kind of the top level stuff and then um, Hallie will go through the design and all that. Uh, but so for every project that we start with for any, for any client, for any market, for um, any project of any kind, we always start with the funnel map. Um, setting this up is a, is a combination of several, several years of trial and error. Um, we learn, you know, sort of from every product, project. But more than anything, we try to use what's already been proven to work according to direct response testing, usually from guys like Dan Kennedy or even Frank Kern or, or people of that um, sort of caliber. So this strategy, uh, we didn't invent. Um, almost nothing here we invented at all, in fact. Um, we, but let me walk you through kind of how it works. So um, in 99 out of 100 cases, we'll start with uh, PPC ads or search ads. And the reason we do that is because if you can't convert the people that are looking for your solution at the moment that they're looking for your solution, then the odds of converting people who are not looking for your solution are nearly zero. So this one distinction here about starting in the right place um, could make or break your first couple months um, in marketing. So we almost always start with rare exception um, with search traffic because it's the highest intent traffic. What we'll typically do then is take what we learn from search traffic and cross pollinate that into interruption traffic. And so Google is search traffic, Facebook is interruption traffic. When people are on Facebook, they're not expecting to hear from you. They don't wanna hear from you. They wanna see what their friends are up to. You gotta interrupt them to get a customer out of them. Um, so we almost always start on um, uh, Google uh, or any search traffic equivalent. Amazon, for example, is a search engine. Um, and then the next thing that we do um, is we will send traffic to a series of sales pages, uh, in this case, a squeeze page. And a squeeze page is just where you're exchanging a valuable piece of information um, for the right to follow up with your prospects. So um, there's a funny saying in direct response, the, uh, there's 10 commandments of direct response. Uh, the first commandment is write great copy. Uh, the second commandment is test. The third commandment is test. The fourth commandment is test and commandments five through 10 are test. So the more that we're testing, uh, we, we always start with our best guesses from what our previous tests have shown us from what 100 years of test results um, from other uh, marketing campaigns and writers have shown us. But even with that head start, um, we test, 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 and then we test those tests. And then we test that the sun rises in the east and then we test that test. That's really the answer. And the reason is because the greatest copywriters and marketers in the world 
I mean, the greatest in the world, guys that have written letters that have been mailed 600 million times, they're still only correct about 30% of the time. So how do they mail this thing 600 million times? If, if they did it that many times, it means it was profitable. How'd they get profitable? By testing, uh, in that case, over four to five years of testing. So anyway, we're always testing. Uh, we'll typically start with about four landing pages. The minimum criteria that you want to test is three, and I'll, and I'll cover that in a little bit as to why. So three is the minimum. Never do less than three. Um, you want to go anywhere from four to 12 on an initial test. It really, how much you do, how many steps you test. Uh, depends on the urgency of the project and how much budget you have because the more testing you do, it does increase the price. Uh, but three is the minimum. So when people look at these sales pages, we're exchanging a lead magnet. Um, we take them through a, um, what I call a, a hooks and loops email sequence, which is, um, a, it's really a combination of uh, hooks and loops, uh, but also the made to stick uh, story framework from the guys that wrote the book made to stick. And if you guys haven't read that book, I, I strongly encourage anyone on here to, to pick up a copy. It will change. Um, it, it's really, really incredible, actually, the insights from the book. So we, we use basically the five or six criteria that makes a story stick. Um, and then we send people through an indoctrination sequence. And the reason we use stories is because um, for lack of a, of a better way to describe it, what a story does is it sort of bypasses the prefrontal cortex and activates the emotional center of the brain. Uh, there's another book called Descartes' Error, which describes pretty, pretty accurately that all decisions are really made in the emotional center of the brain. So what that tells us is that at least for a cold prospect, if we open up with stats and facts, odds are we're going to lose them. It's not going to stick. It's not going to create an emotional state, and therefore it won't create an emotional decision. So typically when we're doing a made-to-stick story sequence, um, and I'll show you guys all of this in the copy, we're starting with a really, really high um, drama. We start with peak drama. Uh, we, we detail an extremely visual story. So we're telling people what the character is seeing, feeling, tasting, smelling, experiencing. Um, and then uh, we drive that, of course, we, it, the more emotion we can create, the better. And typically, conflict creates emotion. And uh, through the story, we are sort of embedding objections in a lot of cases into what the character is thinking, saying, and feeling. So we'll take your prospect's objections and we'll make that um, with some creative license and some romanticizing what the prospect is thinking or feeling from our interpretation. And then through the story, we'll sort of bust that objection or block that objection before it shows up. All right. And so uh, from here, the reason we have this is because um, 80% of everybody that looks at your page, it, it doesn't do what you want them to do. And maybe it's 75, maybe it's 90, uh, maybe it's 85, but the majority in every case, in almost every case, isn't going to do what you want them to do? The answer is usually no on the first pass, which means it makes sense for us to follow up with them over and over again with highly engaging content. All right. So, um, so this, just a real quick one, run through on this before we dive into the actual mechanics. So we run Google ads, um, we're on Facebook ads, we send them to four different landing pages. All four of those landing pages go, um, get added to a hooks and loops uh, made to stick story sequence. Um, that story sequence sends people to funnel step three, which is schedule your call. And typically we will recommend call rail or the equivalent call rail is the best that we found. Um, and you record them and you run a script. I'm not going to talk about like call center stuff. I'm sure you guys are aware of, you know, all of that. Um, uh, but I would strongly recommend a script. It's the only way to standardize the process. And if you're scaling multiple locations, um, and you have people in training, you have compliance, uh, you know, there's a little bit of a liability too, in some cases when you have salespeople on the phone. So, so record it, transcribe it, coaching, all of that. Um, all right. So let's talk about the, and by the way, let me keep the chat open. Oh, the mic, uh, I'm going to answer questions as I go along. The mic is, a, is an Electro Voice RE30, I believe. Um, so, so thanks. Um, and if you guys have questions, throw them in the chat box. I'll answer them as we go instead of waiting till the end. Um, Cool. So what we're looking at here is, um, as far as I know, it's proprietary. I've seen other people do stuff similar to this, um, but we call this, this is our proprietary OceanNet technology, the OceanNet protocol. And the reason we call it that is because when we're doing our keyword research, we take every keyword that uh, your market has ever typed into Google to search for your solution, um, according to Google keyword search tools and a couple other tools. And then we take that and we run it through this formula here in the spreadsheet. And uh, we, we extrapolate from the root keywords every possible combination and variation of those keywords. And in this way, 
Uh, we are casting a net over the entire ocean. And so the reason we do this goes back to the Ten Commandments of direct response, right? Great copy and then test, test, test. So we know with a reasonable estimation um, what people are searching for and um, what they're typing in and what keyword search volume and all that stuff is. But we don't know for sure until we spend some actual money doing it. Hey, Sierra, I'm on, I'm on a webinar. So... Um, this is the solution. Basically, we take, we take um, let's see how many keywords here. Uh, I can't scroll because the screen's taken up. So we take about five, six, seven, eight hundred. Yeah, we take about 694 um, what we call root keywords. And then from that, we run them through these columns because Google has several different types of matches. They have broad match, exact match, phrase match, modified broad match. And then because... Um, because most people are searching for, you know, bankruptcy attorney near me uh, before or after that phrase, we go ahead and put that in the formula as well. Uh, we also do in my area. That's a really standard search. Um, we also do in my city before and after and in my state before and after. And so I, I heard someone mention earlier today, like sometimes when you have a satellite location, you have to clarify that your um, that people have to search your location in the keyword. Yeah, one, that's true. And one way that you handle that is by running ads with that exact keyword in this, in this campaign. Um, so from there, so we did this for each market because obviously people in Miami are not searching for uh, bankruptcy attorney, attorneys in uh, Chicago. Um, from there, we will typically consolidate all of these keywords. Google has a 10 word character limit. So we have to run another formula over here. But what you'll see is that we extrapolate about, in the case of this market, just under 10,000 keywords, 9,700, 9,702 keywords. So if you were to sit down and try and write all of those by yourself or anybody were to try and write all of those yourself, it would take you weeks, months, and it would be, you know, maybe the most boring work in the world. But with this spreadsheet, we cast a net over the entire ocean, and it takes us about 20 minutes to put together at the most. So that's the most important part is that we start with a, a net over the entire ocean, and then we are testing, improving by, we start with impressions and then click-through rates, what keywords uh, we're proving, which keywords actually lead to you getting customers. So the next thing we do is we will add those keywords and, and I'm going to go over the ads uh, themselves and, the, uh, and all of that other stuff in a little bit, but I want to start. Um, oh, yeah, sorry, Katie. I, 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 can't, uh, I can't hand that out. I'm sorry. Um, so um, we will typically we'll put these keywords into each campaign separately. Uh, we, we test the campaigns based on markets or uh, ad groups. And then what we're using to determine if we're getting traction initially is the impressions. Now, um, here's the thing about testing 10,000 keywords. 85, 90% of them are not going to get used. We don't know which 85 to 90% of those aren't going to get used and which 5 to 10% are going to get used until we use real money. A lot of tools that can help us do a best guess, but there's no way to know for sure what real people were actually searching in the search bar at the moment that your ads were live until you spend a dollar or two to do so. Um, so for that reason, we'll test about 10,000. And then we take this, you'll see there's a long tail of keywords. Um, I wonder if I can even, yeah, so I can show about 500 at a time. So there's a long tail of keywords. And we get a lot of impressions, which are only getting one, two, three um, per month, sometimes per year. The thing is, you know, uh, look, this, who in the world would think to, to type in file BK, right? I, I would never, as a writer, abbreviate bankruptcy to BK. Someone did. And so now we're in front of them. So this is just an example of uh, casting a net over the entire ocean. Um, from there, we will typically test um, according to click-through rate, but let me show you how we do that with the ads. So um, for each, and actually let me show all that we tested. So for each market, we will typically set up four different uh, ad campaigns and groups and landing pages. And the reason we do that is, uh, as I'll show you here in ClickFunnels and Infusionsoft, um, whenever you're sending people from an ad set to a separate URL, uh, what you want to do is make sure that each campaign is tracked separately. So for, for each market, Chicago, St. Louis, Miami, uh, we have ad groups A, B, C, and D. And for testing purposes, we'll typically go A1, 
A2, B1, B2, so on and so forth. Um, I've even seen uh, H3 variations, which tells you how much testing that company did. So um, each ad group gets a very similar set of ads, though slightly different. And what you'll notice is we are uh, testing according to, and actually this thing's in the way, um, we are testing for click-through rate in most cases. And since that is not on the tab, let's go ahead and add it, apply. And so the click-through rate, as you see over here, the highest click-through rate ad group was in Chicago for ad group A, then Miami, then St. Louis D, and then St. Louis B. So 4.1, that's pretty good in a testing phase. You can't really hope for much more than that. If we were to optimize that, we could get it higher. But that, that number also includes the losing ads, which uh, let's go ahead and show you those. So, um, and, and again, if I'm, if I'm going too fast or if you guys have questions, um, throw them in the chat. Yeah, the negative keywords. So we actually will throw the negative keywords in about day 30 or 60. And the reason is we don't, because we're testing 10,000 keywords, we don't know, we don't really know what those negative keywords are. Now we take a, a list um, for each uh, niche that we work in and we cross pollinate from one client to the next until we grow a sort of a base list of negative keywords. But the problem with doing that, the reason we start wide open um, initially is because uh, sometimes we're, th what makes it a negative keyword is actually in most cases subjective and it might be different for you, the client. So we actually will have the clients review what they want in the negative keywords. So, um, so the standard answer is anywhere between day 30 and 60. We usually start wide open at day zero. We'll go to day 30, day 60. Um, and then after that, once the client uh, or, or you in this example, um, takes a look at the negative keywords that you don't want. We'll add that to the base list and then we'll, we can cross pollinate that. Um, Mike and Allison, a negative keyword is a word that you want Google to not show your ad for. So if someone says free bankruptcy, for example, which is sometimes a good negative keyword, then whenever they type in free bankruptcy, if you've added that to your negative keyword list, your ad will not show um, for that keyword. And that's important in some cases because it, you know, one school of thought says you don't want to be looking for customers that are looking for free bankruptcies. Um, there's, you know, actually three sides to that coin in most cases. But um, if you have decided that you don't want to work with the sort of client that's looking for, yeah, cheap attorney. <laughs> that's perfect. Yeah, that, that'd be one that you probably don't want, unless you're a cheap attorney, in which case you want to double down. But I don't think there are any of those here. Um, all right. So, uh, yeah, keep the questions coming. This is great. Free let me, let me, hey, Randy, let me throw something yeah. in there, though, too. This cheap attorney... Um, is what we talked about a little while ago, though, too, is we may want to have a campaign that goes after that with that should I or should I not file with an attorney approach, you know, where we can get those people at least to come to a landing page to start convincing them why they need an attorney, right? So that might even be a viable. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, that's, and that was what I meant by, you know, the three sides to that coin, because that customer, if they're in search for bankruptcy, you might just have to move them from free to paid, but they're still a potential customer. It takes a different set of processes to do that. So yeah, totally, totally spot on, James. Um, all right, so let's look at the um, ads and I'm gonna move my window here again. Um, I really need two screens for this, but uh, we'll get to that later. So um, let's start with the highest click through, which was um, Chicago Ad Group E. Excuse me. And so what we'll find here, um, we'll typically, uh, through each keyword, we'll rank them for click-through rate. Um, so <laughs> this is kind of a funny, funny little thing with Google. If you get one impression and one click, you've got 100% click-through rate. That typically doesn't hold. Um, just so you guys know, to make the click-through rate a valid statistic, you need a minimum of 300 impressions. And the reason is um, that is three standard deviations of 100. So it's like Chebyshev's theorem, if we've got any business statistics fellas uh, or ladies in the house, it is basically the minimum viable statistically significant sample size is 300. Three standard deviations of 100. So that means if we're looking over here, we got a click-through rate of 2.3, but we've only got 47 impressions. We know that that's not statistically valid. It's a nice number to look at, makes us feel good. It's not statistically valid. So the only thing that's valid is uh, these above 300. Um, so that's just kind of a side note. And now let's look at the ads. 
this is where the real magic happens. You know, commandment number one of direct response is write great copy. So we will typically write from swipe, which um, a swipe file is a collection of um, copy or headlines or any kind of um, marketing that has been written before that is either the control or close to the control. And the control is the difference between, um, so we use the scientific method and in a scientific test, you have a control group and a variation. So the control is typically the winning piece of copy. We will typically start there. Uh, controls don't always cross over from markets, um, but it is the best place to start. So um, we use a, uh, this I will kind of share with you guys as a bonus. If you, if you want to get into the copywriting, the ads writing side of it, which will, would never hurt a business owner of any kind, um, there's a newsletter by Clayton Makepeace. I think it's called The Screaming Eagle. And this is free on the internet. So if you guys want, I can uh, provide a link for that. But it's basically a, um, it's about a 12 to 15 page document outlining how you can write bullets or what are now called fascinations. Anyway, we use that to write these. Um, that's sort of our template. We adapt it to each market that we're in. Uh, but we start with, excuse me, that document. So if you guys want that, um, I'm happy to include it. What's the typical life of the test campaign before a particular game plan comes to the front? We like to test it around 90 days. Uh, the first 30 days you are, the phrase is the first is the worst. Um, so for the first 30 days, we are working out the operational kinks. Um, all right, yeah, I'll, I'll include the Screaming Eagle if you guys want. Yeah, it's one of the best uh, documents I've ever read. And I read about 100 books a year. It's amazing. Um, so... Yeah, we, we typically, what was the question again? How, typical life of a test campaign before it comes to the game front. So the short answer is 30 days, you're buying data. Day 60, you're cranking the winners, you're reducing the losers. Day 90, you're full steam ahead. That's in a perfect scenario. The, the reality is that depends on your budget, that depends on your market. Um, we're living in pretty crazy times right now. So any data that you get at this moment is uh, just unique data because we're living in unique times. Um, so, um, all right. So, yeah, I'll include the Screaming Eagle stuff um, by Clayton Makepeace. And so when we have these ads, what we're typically looking for is uh, CTR stands for click-through rate. And again, if we don't have 300 impressions, we don't consider it statistically valid. So part of the reason that if you look at this from the ad set level, um, the CTR is lower than 5.2 or 2.47 is because it's including um, all these together. So when you're in the um, control phase, as we call it, which is usually around day 90, you'll see your click through rates hovering between three and five or six. Um, these are actually really, really good. Um, the more you test, the more of these you can get, but by and large 5.42% is um, a lot of people would be very, very, very happy if they could just get that number. Um, so, what we do is we're always testing headlines. So you'll notice the body copy, credit card debt piling up, pressure from the spouse. It's the same, that's the same for every single ad that we run. And that's because when you write your headline, you've spent about 80% or 80 cents on every dollar of your ad budget. The headline is the most important thing by far in almost every scenario. So we start with the headline uh, in the test phase. Once we have some controls, we'll then start testing variation on the body copy. But the headline always comes first. You can see the difference between one headline and another headline. Uh, this, one's almost tw this one's more than twice as effective as this one, okay? So debt, debt relief, dirty tricks, discover what they're hiding. People are responding to that. Um, and that's just proven by the data. So all of these send people to a ClickFunnels page and I will um, I'll open a couple of these for you guys. And we'll start with uh, variation A. Actually, you know what? Let me do something a little bit out of sequence, but will make more sense. So we send everyone to uh, sales page A, B, C, or D. In this case, none of those four variations work. So we created a fifth one, which is form E, uh, which is uh, this one here, even though it says form D is form E. Um, and that's another reason that we, we test three minimum, but you really want to be anywhere between six and 12, uh, because it could be that you have no winners in that four and those first four. So anyway, each page gets a unique form and the reason that we do this is when people come through page A, page B, page C, page D, we can apply a tag which tracks them at the contact level, 
contact level record, contact record level. Um, and the reason you want to do that is because tracking is the most, it's the most important part of your, of your direct response marketing campaign, but it's also in the digital world, the most difficult to get right because computers are just inherently complex. And I'm sure you guys have seen, you get conflicting data all the time. Systems aren't designed to work together. So they, that you get one number on one system, another number on another system. And the only way to really, really, really know for sure what your actual tallies are is to mark each contact record. Um, Cause you'll get one number from Google, another from Facebook, another from ClickFunnels, another from a link tracking software, which is supposed to fix that. And the only thing that really gives you the actual numbers is Infusionsoft or Infusion is, is some of you guys call it. Um, when calling the call URL tracking number is automatically creating a contact record. Um, no, so Alfredo, the, um, the way that we handle that, and actually I'll get into that, but no, the uh, contact record is created when they opt in to the form here in ClickFunnels. So um, what happens is the ads send them to this page. And then when they say, you know, this is where they type in their name, number, and email, um, you know, this is them saying, hey, yeah, you can talk to me because I, I want to read this free report. And then their phone number, this is where the contact record is created. Um, so, but because it's a little bit nuanced, let's talk about this. You'll see we have this call 855-204-7544 number. That's actually a catch-all number for the people that won't opt in because we're spending money to send them to that page. If they want to talk to us first instead of opting into a form, if they're ready to pick up the phone, that means they're super hot. So we don't want to lose out in most cases on that traffic. Sometimes you don't want to have a number on there because you have conflicting test data. But in this case, we chose to have them able to call. So that's this catch-all number right here. So I hope that answers your question and it might've been more detailed than you wanted. Um, okay, so we send ads to this page here and for each sales page, A, B, C, and D, we connect them through a separate form entirely because we wanna be tracking at the contact record level, which is the ultimate decider. Now, a lot of data before that's very good. Um, when it comes to your true cost, you wanna track at the contact record level. Um, so from there, we send them a lead mag delivery email. The lead mag stands for lead magnet. Um, and it's just an email that says, hey, click here to read it now. So everywhere, everywhere in the funnel we're combining, this is a concept, um, this is a concept I learned from actually P.T. Barnum. Uh, everywhere in the funnel, we're giving them what they asked for and we're bolting on what we want from them. So every time we talk to them, we say, hey, here's what you were expecting. Here's a good piece of value. Here's a story. By the way, you should do this, which is call us and give us money <laughs> in this case. So in every touch point, we are, um, in most touch points, we are combining value with a call to action. So that's why we have this click here, schedule your call now. Um, so from there, so all pages A through E go to the same lead mag. And then we send them to a hooks and loop sequence. So before I go into this, let me go back over these other pages. So what we test in, uh, on the page itself is just like what we test on the headlines or on the uh, Google ads, which is the headlines. We, we're always, always testing headlines first because when you write your headline, you spend 80 cents on every dollar of your ad budget. And so what we test here is thanks for choosing Better Days Ahead Law Firm. That's a presupposition. They haven't chosen Better Days Ahead Law Firm, but when they read that, it's implied that they have. And so subconsciously, maybe they do. Um, Free report reveals secrets your creditors don't want you to know. And so all along here, um, and I'll get into the, the nuance in this copy in a little bit, but let me show you the headline stuff first. I, uh, I could go on for days on most of this stuff. So um, this is page A. Here's page B. It's a shame for you to keep paying so much when it can be so easily fixed. Dangerous bankruptcy mistakes that could cost you a fortune. <clears throat> that you would think that page would test really well. I, I think it didn't test well at all. I don't remember, I, don't, I need to look at the numbers. Um, here's another headline. Are you working hard, but just can't seem to chip away at that massive mountain of debt? Okay, here's a free report that reveals what honest and hardworking Americans should do if they can't get ahead. Um, I would think that one would perform even better. Again, I don't, I don't have the numbers. Um, so what I wanna show you now though is, is part of what makes this page work. We use, um, in copywriting, we use a technique called embedded commands. And the way that you do that um, is by bolding certain words, which if left unbold or unemphasized would be a natural part of the sentence, but when bolded and emphasized become a, com a, a command to the subconscious. So, and guys, if I'm going too far into the technicals on this, you know, feel free to stop me. But if you want, 
you know, I can keep talking about this particular part because it's part of what makes it work. So in this line right here, we have debt settlement companies do not want you to read this now. Credit card companies do not want you to read this now. The repo man does not want you to read this now. And so what the subconscious here is, is read this now. Okay. And so that will boost conversions. So anyway, that's one little uh, super nuanced copy, uh, copy tactic that we use. So then what happens is, um, oh, cool. Thanks, Laura. Um, so then what happens is we send people uh, from here to a confirmation page. And on that confirmation page, uh, what we get is, um, is, again, is a mix of what they're expecting and what we want from them. Here's your, your free report has been sent to your email. Okay, you can call this number now, which is different, by the way, from uh, the previous number, because now we have, um, we're tracking them on A, B, C, D, or E, and there's a separate number for each. Um, and then we give them immediately, we give them the option to schedule a call with a bankruptcy professional right now. Um, and this is where you would embed your acuity or schedule once uh, tool. Typically we'll include a, a countdown timer here. It tends to boost conversion, even though if you <laughs> set it where nothing happens, nothing happens, um, people respond to it. Even if they don't think it's real, for some reason, people still respond to it. Um, it's better to make it real, obviously, in, in every case. So, um, from there, most people, like I said earlier, the majority is not going to do what you want them to do when you want them to do it. They're going to do what they want to do when they want to do it. So we have to follow up with them. And that's part of why the squeeze page is so important. If we ran traffic to just the lead magnet, okay, without asking for anything in return whatsoever, we would lose the right to send these five, six, or seven emails and actually as many emails as you want. Now, obviously, there's some different, there are times when you don't want to demand an email uh, as we ended up doing in campaign test E. Um, but by default, you want to be able to email people as much as you can. So let's, let's dive into the um, hooks and loops part. So a, um, a hook is anytime, um, it's part pattern interrupt, it's part survival response, um, it's high emotion, it's peak drama, it's curiosity, it's anything that hooks people and stops them in their tracks from what they're doing and gets them to read what you're writing to them. So you can't hook somebody by facts or numbers, okay, unless the numbers are inherently detailing a peak drama or high, high drama story. So what we'll do is in the subject line, and in emails, the subject line is the effect of the headline. So if we were going to test this, we'd write 10 different headlines for this one email. Um, and we always use their first name in every possible instance because there is no sweeter sound, right? Uh, so we say, hey, uh, contact first name. Time stood still until, and then the copy says, wait, what? I cannot believe this happened to me. So there's a couple things going on here just in those two sentences. First of all, we're using the first name as we described. Uh, secondly, peak drama. Third, we're actually using subtle rhyme, which rhyme in itself will increase readership and increased readership increases response. And then um, on the preview text, we're saying, wait, what? I cannot believe this happened to me. So this is pure curiosity. What? What happened to you? I can, you can't believe what? And so that gets someone to just click on it because they got to know what happened. So then we start with um, the made to stick story. So that's the hook. Okay. And then we're going to do the story and I'll get you to the loop in just a second. Um, and a made to stick story is highly visual. It's highly emotional. And there usually needs to be some kind of drama or conflict. I want to know what happened. Uh, <laughs> hey, Mike. Um, so uh, here's the story. Christmas snow fell as I pulled up to our house, home from work, suspiciously early. So just in that one sentence, you know that it's Christmas. You know that it's snowing. You know he's home before he should be and that there's something up. And so this is written from the point of view of the um, reader. And the reason we do that is because that gets the reader to feel as if they are the person in the story, which connects the, the story's experience with their experience. Um, <laughs> Chris, that's funny. Good point, Mike. Um, yeah, I guess this, I guess this guy wasn't in living in Miami at the time, huh? <laughs> so, all right. Christmas snow fell as a pull up to our house, home from work suspiciously early. She would definitely know something is up. Lump in my throat, heart racing. So we're describing how the character is feeling so that our reader feels the same way. And as you read this, because of empathy, you'll feel a little bit of a lump in your throat and your heart racing if you read it, you know, if it's written correctly. So I couldn't get out of the car for two hours, which felt like eternity. I was scared, embarrassed, 
paralyzed. Most of all, I was so damn angry, angry at myself. After breathing slowed down, I forced a smile, hopped out of the car and walked up the snowy steps with my head down. Can you guys feel like you're in this story right now? Can you see what is happening? Do you feel the emotion at all? Okay. So, and this is how someone in bankruptcy, a proud father trying to provide for his, his wife and kids and put a roof over their house, this is how they feel. I never wanted my wife to worry about money. I've always been a provider, a good father, a faithful husband, but how could I keep a straight face when we were so clearly screwed? <laughs> she was surprised to see me home. She looked at me with the beautiful brown eyes and immediately sensed that something was wrong. She leaned in, grabbed my hand and said, what happened, honey? And so her sweet, loving eyes were just too kind, too perfect for me to hold back. And so I broke down in tears and told her everything. Now, this story, if you ask me, is just really too sappy, okay? The thing is, this is what people respond to is high drama, high emotion, high conflict, as visual as you can make that with a little bit of dialogue in between, the, the better that's going to work. And so what this story does is this gets someone hooked. We're triggering dopamine. And then instead of telling them the end of the story, we ask them to click here to keep reading. So that's what's called an open loop. All right. So we'll hook them and then we loop them. So it's the hooks and loops part. Uh, the hook is the title. Made to stick is how the body copy reads. And then this is the open loop. So from each of these emails, we send them to a story follow-up page. And uh, that starts with story page one. And you'll notice it is continued from the email. So if they want to know the ending of the story, they have to click the button in the email and then they read this. Um, and then what do we have at the very end of this hooks and loops sequence? An invitation to schedule a call with us. Um, so that's how we run um, the hooks and loops. We will typically write anywhere from one to five, sometimes six um, steps in that hooks and loops sequence. So each story is different. The only thing that limits how many of these we can write is how many stories you, the attorney, have from your clients. Excuse me. And of course, uh, the time it takes for us to write them. But by and large, it is more a variable of what kind of stories you have um, than anything else. So uh, we go through and we write all of those. And um, I am going to, sh are the hooks and loops tested also? So they, in a perfect world, they would be. Um, we test we typically will test in the sequence that the user experiences along the way. So testing the hooks and loops, we would split test those um, after the 90 day mark, maybe, maybe even in the 120 day mark. And the reason is, although they're very, very important, um, that's not where the bulk of the action is happening. It's, it, you need to have them there. Um, but it, it makes sense to, um, to test them later. You want to test them, but they're not a priority test, if, that, if, that, if that's helpful. Um, so we got no stories, James. Got any to share? What if we have no bankruptcy client source? So I am not a compliance expert on whose stories you can use when, where, and why, as I recently discovered. So uh, I would refer to James on that. I, I can't tell you. And so I don't know what it's like um, specifically in each state that you guys are from because there are different laws. There are some industries where it is perfectly acceptable to tell somebody else's story. Um, I don't know if that's the case in your market and your state or not. Um, but I will tell you that in a, in a market that is not highly regulated, that's what we will do uh, is tell someone else's story. All right. Um, so I'm, I'm going to show you guys before I hand it over to Hallie, I'm going to show you guys some really technical stuff. And if this already feels technical, you're like, what could be more technical? Um, you know, buckle up, but I promise you, this is, this is where the, uh, this is where the magic dust is made or whatever you want to call it. So, so if we take a break a little bit and go back to the whole thing about direct response, the, the 10 commandments are write, great copy, test, 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 one through 10 or two through 10. So in order to test effectively, you have to have some way to measure. And this is where um, as important as it is to test and measure, this is where it gets really, really difficult to do that um, in the digital environment because it is so complex. Computers are by their very nature complex. I don't know if you guys have ever looked at a processor schematic. It's like, it may as well be alien technology. Um, and so getting all these servers to communicate and trade data and all that, it's very, very difficult to do. Um, whereas in the old days, if you wanted to test a mailer, you'd put a thousand letters with one phone number, a thousand with another phone number, a thousand with another phone number. You'd code them A1, A2, A3, you're done. Now you have, you can count your responses from A1, A2 from the order forms and you've tested, all right? That's how it works in the last hundred years with like mail order. In the digital world, it's very, very difficult to do that. Um, so in order to do that, it, but it's also, it's equally critical. 
Um, so in order to do that, we use a, a tool um, called UTM parameters and UTM stands for urchin tracking modules. And if you ask me, it was probably universal tracking modules first, but they wanted to make it sound cuter. So they call it urchin. Anyway, it's UTM. Um, it's a company that's owned by Google. Um, <clears throat> and what they do is they will append some, some details to your contact uh, records and the parameters. So without getting too technical, let me go ahead and show you how this works. Um, basically, yeah, let's open up a contact here. And what you want to do, I need to show you the ClickFunnels builder to go through this. Um, each time someone lands on your page, they're filling in a form. And now we had to get a uh, way to get someone to write some custom script for this. Uh, and, and the reason I'm showing you guys this, by the way, because this is a really, it's a really boring part, but as I've said, it's critical. The other thing is, and if you guys want, let me know, I will put together a, an, like an agency or vendor shopping guide for you with the questions to ask to know if you're dealing with a professional or a poser. Um, and on that guide, so if you guys want that, please, okay, I, I'll do that for you. So the newsletter and the questions. So one of those questions would be, how are you tracking and how, you, how do you integrate your UTM parameters? Just that, that sentence right there. How do you integrate your UTM parameters? So I've been in meetings before on like paid consulting hours where I asked the guy, uh, I was brought in to, to fix the PT Barnum problem, which is, um, you know, I know that at least half the money I spent on ads is wasted. The trouble is I don't know which half. Um, you will not go through a hooks and loop sequence on my side. <laughs> uh, I will give it to you without any, any, uh, shenanigans. <laughs> so, uh, good question. <laughs> That's funny. Um, so anyway, I was in this guy's office and I'm working with his ads manager, uh, on consulting time. And I said, all right, so show me your UTM parameters. And the guy was like, what are UTM parameters? At which point I knew that my, that the, my consulting client was like royally screwed. So you have to have UTM parameters. The trouble is they're really, really difficult to set up. And actually in some cases we don't set them up if the scope is too small or if the budget is too low, because it does take a lot of time and it is another layer of complexity. Um, however, yeah, so yeah, exactly, James. Mike, this is the kind of stuff you don't, you do not want to know how to do this. Trust me. Um, you don't, but you do need to know that it needs to be done and you need to know how to ask someone uh, the questions which will indicate that they are or are not capable of it. So, um, let me pull up a contact record and show you what this does. So basically, whenever we get some contacts here, I'm just going to open a couple of them. What happens is when we send someone to a landing page, oh man, way too many windows here. When we send someone to a landing page, um, we actually have this form. We have this, these are, um, embedded uh, HTML forms. So the first form here is click or is uh, Infusionsoft. And we paste the code here and then we'll typically integrate it um, from the top, top level uh, here in the integration set settings. Very complex, you don't need to worry about that. That's what we handle for you. But right here is a really important part. Um, hired a developer to write some scripts. What this script does is it pulls from the URL, the UTM parameters of that contact, of that person's uh, click path. So I know that's complicated. Let me show you what that does. What that does is that allows us to determine, here's the really important part, okay? It allows us to determine which keyword that person typed in before they became a contact record. So the way that we do that is custom fields and UTM term right here. So we know that Anthony, he typed in bankruptcy or debt consolidation. All right, what does that tell us? Well, if we get enough of those, that means we need to be doubling down on those keywords, especially if when you take this guy on a sales call and you close the deal, you go and you mark him manually as closed one, opportunity closed one, and you start ranking your opportunities closed one, and you see that all of your opportunities that put cash in the bank came from this keyword, and even though you're getting more traffic on something like, you know, cheap attorney and you get no sales from it, well, now you have the data to make that decision and you're not shooting blind. So getting that done, really complex. 
super critical. Um, let's look at another contact record. Um, this guy typed in, what do I need to file bankruptcy chapter 13? All right, so we know that that's what someone's typing in. That's so, so, so important because this is the only way for us to track who becomes a sale by manually updating their contact record and then going in and looking at our um, keywords. You don't have to set up, you don't know which keywords to double down on. You're just guessing. So this is, it's really difficult to do, but incredibly important. You got to write custom fields in here. Uh, you got to build UTM parameters in a separate um, only through PPC, not through Facebook. Actually, Facebook does uh, does allow you to set some some UTM parameters. Yeah, that that complicates it a lot um, because now you have attribution overlap. Like, are they a Facebook lead? Are they a Google lead? Um, but you can actually use a lot of this uh, with Facebook, Alfredo. Uh, there's some nuance into into making them work together nicely, but it is possible through Facebook. Um, Almost 40 BK firms on this call alone. If only 25% of those on this call hire how are you, how you differentiate their marketing campaign so we don't have the same campaign? What would make somebody call me or another firm on the call if they're saying the same things? So first of all, we will typically work with market exclusivity and, and that's, there's an exception to that. But by and large, um, Mike, if, if you and someone else uh, on this call is in your city, so the only time we would work with both of you in that case is if you guys were going after distinctly different target markets. So um, in that way, we can serve both of you in the same city and there's no conflict. Because if you're looking for discount bankruptcy clients and this other guy is looking for white glove, high ticket bankruptcy clients, there's a very different strategies and communication for each of those prospects. Um, so in that way, we would have two people in the same territory. But otherwise, um, we, it is basically first come, first serve. Um, and, <laughs> uh, I, I want to piggyback on that, Randy, too, yeah. because that's a great question, Mike. Um, and it's something, no matter what vendor you use, you need to ask that question. I just recently had a member that is in Oklahoma city area. They're using, um, one of the, one of the vendors that are, that a lot of people are using and they asked that specific question and, and they wanted to see behind the scenes. They wanted to see the data They wanted, to, and they wouldn't let him see it. And he found out that they're representing three of the exact same practice area of attorneys, like within 10 miles of each other, you know, and they're, and so they're, they don't want them to see it because they're doing the same freaking campaign for all three of them. And that is why he's having trouble. And that is why he fired them. But that is the guy I was telling you about that was in a 12 month deal. Um, so it's a great question to ask. And then I'll shut up. Um, yeah. <laughs> and James, you're spot on as usual. There are a lot of companies that will take campaigns and cross pollinate them into the same market. The reason that is, well, the biggest reason that doesn't work is because now you have identical ads competing for the same ad space, which drives the costs up considerably. Because if, if you have three clients bidding on the same keyword with the same ad, Google's gonna decide w one of those ads gets shown, maybe two, um, but in either case, they're competing for that spot, so they drive the price up. So what you're getting is an enhanced cost for reduced effectiveness. Um, Mike Redondo got, got your question. I guess I responded to Mike Brennan accidentally, but Mike uh, Redondo, I, I, I'm with you. Um, so, yeah, so the question, the answer is we will typically work in um, exclusivity exclusively um, with the exception being if a, if the attorney in your area, whether you know them or not, is targeting a distinctly different uh, avatar, in which case there's no conflict because you're going after different customers, even though you're in the same geography. So I hope that answers that. Uh, did I miss any questions up here? And uh, the last part of your question, Mike Brennan, what would make someone call me or another firm on the call if they're saying the same things? So what makes anybody call anybody is um, th the best way to describe this is that they say that people don't buy when they understand necessarily. Uh, they buy when they feel understood. And this was one of the first conversations James and I had. And this is when I knew that, that James was the real deal. He said that he likes to enter the conversation occurring in the prospect's mind and speak in such a way um, that describes their problems, their emotion, their pain, their fears, their desires, their hot buttons, where they are exactly right now. And what that does, the reason that works so well is not just what's in it for me, the, the whole with them thing, which is really, really important, 
But the reason that works so well is because people, when you do that correctly, feel understood. Um, if you really, really nail that, they'll say, um, they'll say something like, oh, I was reading your material and it felt like you were sitting at the dining room table listening in on our conversation because that's exactly what I said. It's like, yeah, that's exactly the point. We want you to feel like you're understood. And when someone feels understood, that's when they buy, not when they understand necessarily. Um, so I hope that helps. And I think that may have been a little left field of what you originally intended, but uh, it is good to know regardless. So um, we will take these UTM parameters. We pull them from the page. We then write them to the Infusionsoft contact records. Uh, the other way we track which way the pages work is we will use tags. Um, so we know this person came from page A. Uh, we know that this person came from page B, for example. And when we get enough records, um, we will go through and sort. Um, we'll actually typically... When we get to a sale, we'll go through and, and back, uh, backwards update the contact records for whichever page created the most sales, not necessarily the most appointments, which as you know, may or may not be different. All right. So I've gone on for what feels like forever. Guys, any more questions for um, Holly or Randy? Um, they, you know, they can put their contact info in the chat. Um, and then we'll let them get on their way and, and then we'll move on with the rest of this session. Rob, we strongly recommend Infusionsoft. And if we work with Active Campaign, we're still kind of figuring out how we're going to handle this. But, um, you know, so what we, what we prefer is Infusionsoft because that's what our team is trained on. It's far more powerful um, it has, I mean, it is the end all, in my opinion, the end all be all autoresponder. So what we're trying to do is not have any clients use active campaign at all. Um, it's not very realistic. So we're considering just increasing the fee slightly for active campaign work because it is out of our system, um, or our recommended tech stack. But so it's not a hard no, but it might just be a little more expensive. We haven't really decided on that yet, Rob. Um, but I would, I would say that if you can switch to Infusionsoft and you don't have like 10 years of automations uh, and the switching cost isn't too high, I would recommend Infusionsoft. It's more expensive, but you get more out of it. Um, if anybody um, wants me to send you, if you guys want me to send you that, that newsletter, I actually have it on my, um, on my drive now. If you'll just, and James, I, I hope this is okay, but if you guys will just email me uh, in the private chat or type your email address into the private chat. I'll just email it to you right after this call. Is that, is that cool, James? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. So if you guys want the, um, if you guys want the newsletter, uh, send it. Uh, Charlotte, you're asking, what about Salesforce? Yeah, that's a hard no on Salesforce. Even, now, I lived in Salesforce for two years when I was on uh, a wholesaling investment desk. We did $28 billion a year in sales, so we used Salesforce. Um, the problem is that it is, ex you will need a, a custom Salesforce developer. Maybe you already have one. We're not Salesforce development experts. I'm sure it can be done. Um, but their autoresponder is Pardot. And now I don't talk to everybody that owns Pardot. Um, but I've never seen, I've never, I've not yet heard anybody speak well about it. Maybe you're the exception. Maybe you've got it and you love it. I don't know. For us, we, we don't typically work with Salesforce. If there are integrations that need to happen, um, we don't know if they are going to work in Salesforce, what the nuances are. We just don't, we typically will avoid it. Um, although obviously it's like the biggest CRM on the planet. So maybe we should take a second look at that. Uh, but for now, the answer is we don't, we won't typically work with uh, Salesforce. Um, all right. Lots of email. Awesome. Lots of emails coming in. Looks like there's a couple hands up. Um, Lisa, if you want to unmute yourself. Hi, I'm just wondering, Hallie, if you, um, Pierre, you're asking, can oh. you handle, oh, is there someone else? Sorry, did I interrupt? Mike and Allison. Okay. Oh, Randy, I was just curious. So we don't, for the bankruptcy firm, we don't currently have a CRM. So if we were to use Infusionsoft, how, how much of that, do you build out 100% of it when you do this? Or does, there, is there a separate buildup that has to happen? We build out 100% of the lead generation portion of Infusionsoft. Yeah, it's, uh, it's included in our, our build out. So the, the good news is there's a lot of things you can do with Infusionsoft besides lead generation, um, which we can get into. But for, lead, for strictly lead gen purposes, to take someone from cold to sold, from an ad to a sales call to an agreement, um, we will build out all of that within Infusionsoft for you. Did I answer your question? 
Um, yeah, but it also sounds like there's additional build outs that have to happen. So do you know other consultants that build out other parts of it? What, um, which, which other parts are you referring well, to? You, you made it sound like for lead gen, you build it out, but there's other parts of Infusionsoft that can be used. I know nothing about Infusionsoft other than it's called Confusionsoft. So you don't necessarily have to use it for something else, but you can. Um, and we can help you build out other things within Infusionsoft. I think that may be what you're asking. Um, and we do that on a case by case basis. It depends on what you need. Um, so it would be, it would really depend on what you're trying to do. Uh, but by and large, yeah, I, the, the reason I described it that way is because Infusionsoft is the Swiss army knife uh, of Swiss army knives. I mean, it can do a, a thousand different things, a thousand different ways for lead gen purposes. We'll build a hundred percent of it. If you need more than that, we can talk about it. It will just typically be a separate project and answer your question now. Yes. Thank you. Um, is there, is there more? I see something in the chat box. Does someone else have their hand raised? No other hands raised. Pierre, you're asking if we can handle this campaign without having to purchase, having to purchase Infusionsoft. Y yeah, but you don't, you don't really want to do that. Um, you, it's, no, I mean, so I guess the answer is technically no, um, because, yeah, you, you need you need an autoresponder of some sort in order to email these hooks and loop sequences. If you were to drive somebody directly from an ad to a call rail page, like call us now without an opt-in form or anything like that, you'd have no way of tracking your conversions. You'd have no way of tracking which keywords came through. You could track at the phone call level, but what you'll typically get is a high volume of low quality leads if you're not filtering in some way. So it is possible. Um, but you can drive with four donuts under a car too. It's only going to work for so long uh, as a crude analogy. Cost for all the software required to run a campaign. So it, it changes. As Hallie mentioned, we, we're moving away from ClickFunnels. To be clear, the reason we use ClickFunnels in this case is because we were on a very tight deadline because James, um, James was cracking the whip. Um, so we, uh, ClickFunnels is like by far the fastest. It's uh, not necessarily the best, but... Um, it is very, very fast. So um, to answer your question, um, so Infusionsoft is about 200 a month. Um, our fee is, uh, it changes. I've, I've made some, as James mentioned, some, some very generous deals prior. Our fee is anywhere between 2300 to 5300 depending on what you need and, and the scope. And you want to be spending not less than 1500 but up to 2500 on ad spend. And so the actual technology portion of it, 225 250 very low. Uh, it's monthly. And I believe it's not on a uh, contract. Um, so average cost is somewhere between two and 300. Now you can get as fancy as you want and bolt on a lot of really cool things for 10 bucks a month here, 15 bucks a month there. Uh, but you're typically looking between two and 300. We're switching away from ClickFunnels. So if anyone is on here that, and we spoke previously and I sent you um, something that said, Hey, get ClickFunnels platinum for like 297 a month. It's no longer applicable, but how does this compare? Oh, Mike and Allison, you ha did we answer your question or do you guys have another one, Mike and Allison? Yeah, I had a follow-up question with regards to infusion stuff. You said basically build out from cold to sold. Um, I, thinking of other CRM uh, systems and programs that are out there that we use, and you know, it's, it's actively um, working with the contacts and getting the information and so forth. Is, is that what you're talking about, the cold to sold build out? or Because I just see a lot of pretty flow charts so that goes from here to here to here, and then that's what you build out? Or is there also the build out of, okay, we're going to nurture even after they're through that, um, that initial flow chart, and maybe they didn't, they didn't uh, get sold, building out reports. I'm, I'm just, I'm confused as far as exactly what Infusionsoft does. Okay. Um so I'll answer your second question first and your first question second. So Infusionsoft does a thousand different things, but what you want it to do for this, for this, for the purpose of generating a lead is to capture that leads contact information from a web page. You do that by building a form, first name, email, phone number in almost every case. So Infusionsoft stores that data. So when they're typing a form on the form, uh, their details in on the internet, instead of it just going to, you know, wherever, it goes straight into your Infusionsoft account. So they show up as a, as a record. So in a traditional CRM, you'd run a list and you would say, show me everyone that signed up on Tuesday the 12th. And you get that list and then you, you know, you pick up the phone and you call them if that's how you operate as a direct sales method. So um, that's the primary function of Infusionsoft. 
It also allows you to build autoresponder campaigns, which are more complex, but equally necessary. And then the number one reason you would use it outside of lead generation is for a broadcast of some sort. So if you're running like a one-time promotion um, or you have a holiday event or something like that. And um, we, we talk about Infusionsoft a lot uh, with our clients because very rarely are we ever tapping into all the horsepower, but it's a case by case basis past that. So I think, I think that was your second question. The first question is from cold to sold for one campaign. Yes, we build it out. Once you join us on a monthly retainer every month, you're getting uh, sequences, steps added to the sequences and broadcast emails um, rewritten. There is some, there was a, there is a, a, a level of cross pollination from market to market so that we can operationally scale, but you're never getting hundred percent duplicative, duplicative content. And quite often that is w- how much you get is going to depend on, what other parts, so if, you, if you're strictly a bankruptcy attorney, um, then we're gonna write content about bankruptcy and we'll write stories and we'll do uh, drip campaigns that are not part of a lead generation campaign. Uh, but if you have, for example, two or three different uh, areas in your practice and that changes what kind of content gets written, who, get, who it gets sent to. So I, I think I'm answering your question. If I'm not, let, let me know and we'll, I can try. Yeah, it, it, I, I, yeah thank you. Okay. Um, how does this compare to building a solution in Microsoft Power Platform? I don't know what Microsoft Power Platform is, so I assume that's like an enterprise level CRM of some sort. But I, 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 I... yeah, it is. Okay, this is Kelly and Dave. Yeah, hey, uh, this is Dave uh, Kelly's husband. I'm basically IT support for her firm. Um, so yeah, basically Microsoft Power Platform seems to do all of that. You can do all of your automation trigger based on forms you know, client input and all of that. Um, I just was, I think you kind of answered the question with your previous description of Infusionsoft actually, because it seems like they do mostly the same thing. Yeah, yeah. The dollars and the details of course, right? So um, so technically all autoresponders do the same thing, um, but there are some really, really granular. So I'm not familiar with the power platform at all. It's the first time I've heard of it. Um, So I don't, the trouble becomes that these tools, if you have a tech stack of say like 10 tools, um, they are all so, computers don't, don't understand anything besides ones and zeros. So a colon versus a semicolon can break an entire campaign. If you have a tech stack of 10 tools integrated like, um, like UTM parameters to click funnels to Infusionsoft to call rail and schedule once, those five tools, if you change one of those tools, the entire system changes and you can't always guarantee that you have integration across the entire campaign, which is part of why we don't, which is part of why we're recommending almost exclusively exactly those tools I I just recommended because each one is different. Each one works differently together. You change one, you've changed everything. So uh, can Microsoft Power Platform do it? I'm sure it can. The question is, can it play nice with all the other tools that we've tested and proven? And and it has taken a, a good number of years to go through all the different iterations and find out what works best together. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Rob, Rob says, you said you're moving away from ClickFunnels. What are you using said WordPress? Um, for reasons that like Hallie mentioned, there's so much more custom customization. And, uh, and we have found as, as fast as ClickFunnels is, it's very easy to get people set up and signed up. There are some features that we feel are important that are worth taking the extra time for. So we're moving to WordPress. I think we're at the end of the questions. Are there more questions? More hands raised, I'm not seeing. We got any more, any more questions or James, anything you want, want us to touch on? No, nope, I think that is it. And um, we are right at the time where we're going to break. So I appreciate you guys coming on.